from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Johnny, this is Byron Kay at Intercoastal Maritime and Life in Boston. Hello, boy. Remember Hurricane Audrey? Back in the latter part of June, sure. Must have hit your company pretty hard. Yes, but if anybody ever needed help, it was those people down in Louisiana and neighboring states. Yeah. So we've paid up the claims just as fast as they've come in. Except for one. Oh, what's that? One we received only a couple of days ago. Okay, bye. Give me the dope and I'll head for Louisiana on the first plane. Wrong direction, Johnny. Huh? Texas? No. Oklahoma? Arkansas? Buffalo, New York. What? And I think you'd better run over here and let me give you some facts. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd better. <laughs> Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of a man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Intercoastal Maritime and Life Insurance Company, Boston, Massachusetts. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Charmona matter. Expense account item one, 1845. Plane fare and incidentals, Hartford to Boston and a cab to Byron Kay's office in the Little Building. Glad to see you, Johnny. Hi. I'm glad you can take this on for me. Uh, sit down. Okay, thanks. Ever hear of Charles Francis Keeley? Ah, uh, Keeley? A very much reformed man, Johnny, who was apparently making a valiant try to live down some of the things he did earlier in his life. Like what? Well, he was a... I guess you'd call him a promoter, stock manipulator, that sort of thing. The point is, he made himself a lot of money a few years back until the authorities, the Securities Exchange Commission and so forth, put a stop to his fancy dealing. Sounds like a real nice guy. In any event, he had enough money by the time he quit to live pretty well. Nice home, beautiful wife, 62-foot cruiser, and that, by the way, is our biggest problem. Oh, I wish my biggest problem was a 62-foot cruiser. It is, Johnny, now. Then tell me all. Yes. Early in June, he took his boat across Lake Erie to Detroit to have some work done on it at the Detroit Yacht Basin. And then, a couple of days before the end of the month, he started back for Buffalo. Oh, yeah, that hurricane was moving north about then, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And his failure to appear in Buffalo within a reasonable time didn't worry his wife a bit. Often before making that same trip, he'd stopped off in Cleveland to visit some of his old cronies. Uh -huh. But by July 20th, she began to get worried. She called the friends in Cleveland. They hadn't seen him. Then she called the Coast Guard. No word. A few days later, a couple of the life preservers from his boat washed up on the south shore of Erie near the little town of Lindsay. Ah. That enough for you, Johnny? How much insurance did he carry? On himself, 35000 On the boat, 106000 I see. Okay, bye. I'm on my way. Expense account item two, transportation to Buffalo, where I signed in at the Stadler Hotel. Item 3, 520 for dinner. Then taxi, that's item 4, to the Keeley home north of Delaware Park on Colvin Avenue. I don't know just when I'd expected Keeley's wife to look like. Suffice it to say, I was pleasantly surprised. She was young, tall, blonde, and beautiful. With eager, sparkling eyes and none of the signs of grief I'd anticipated. I don't know why you registered at a hotel, Johnny. May I call you, Johnny? Why, uh, sure. Please call me Mona. May I pour you another drink? No, no thanks. As I started to say, you could have stayed here. There's plenty of room, as you can see. Uh, yes, yes. This is a very beautiful house, uh, Mona. Yes, but so, so empty now. I get terribly lonely, Johnny. Well, I, uh, of course I don't blame you. But now suppose we talk, if you don't mind, about the Johnny, thing I... if you have to be around for a few days, why don't you move out of that hotel and... Oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. I guess I'm just... I'm sorry. It's all right. But I am lonely. Sure, sure. Now, Mona, you realize this investigation is, uh, well, it's just routine. Of course, Johnny. Now, as I understand, every effort has been made to find your husband. Of course. And to find the Charmona. Charmona? The cruiser. 
Oh, yes, yes. It was a beautiful thing, Johnny. But now it's gone. And Paul... Paul? Yes. Paul Matthews was the pilot. Only he was more than that. He... He was very nice. Yeah. Well, now as I... Oh, excuse me. Every time that phone rings, I... I hope it's some word, some news that perhaps... Well, you know. I'm not sure that I do. What? But by all means, answer it. Yes. Yes, excuse me. There was something distinctly wrong with this whole setup. That was for sure. The Coast Guard, yes. Yes, this is she. This is Mona Keeley. Perhaps Charles Keeley wasn't the only one in this family to arouse suspicion. What? Say that again. Especially now, with nearly $150,000 involved. Yes, well, how about Paul? I said, how about Paul? Then, when she finally finished with the phone call, came a couple of other surprises. Thank you. Thank you. Johnny, he's all right. Huh? That was the Coast Guard. They found him. He's all right. Isn't it wonderful? That was the real surprise. Not what she said. Isn't it wonderful? Or even the way she said it. But something deep back in her eyes that gave her away, that told me beyond the shadow of a doubt that she was lying through her teeth. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. It is a rare event when a young man decides to leave civilization behind and hide himself away in the steaming jungle just so he can help his fellow humans in a remote corner of the world. The late Dr. Tom Dooley did just that when he left the United States to help the sick and starving jungle people in the little kingdom of Laos in Southeast Asia. Dr. Dooley's story is well known to nearly everyone. And all over the world, people talk of his little jungle hospital on stilts. That's where he treated the dread diseases of the jungle and trained native medical technicians so that they might help their own people. Dr. Dooley wrote and lectured to many people so that the work of his medical assistance program, Medico, might go on. It was not easy for someone so young and so talented to give up the bright lights of the city and plant himself down in an unknown jungle just for the purpose of helping unfortunate people he didn't even know. But through Medico, Dr. Tom Dooley wanted to help people. They wanted to help people to help themselves. Today, the work of Medico is going forward in a number of countries besides Laos. Young men are being sent to the United States to be schooled in medicine with the idea of returning to their own countries to help their own people. Hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of medical supplies have been donated by American businessmen and pharmaceutical companies. Today, Dr. Tom Dooley's work is being continued for him. It is helping to create better understanding. It is an injection of the spirit of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Charmona Matter. The news that her husband was still alive came as quite a surprise to Mona Keeley. Isn't it wonderful, she said. But I didn't believe that she meant it. On the south shore of the Lake Johnny, near the little town of Lindsay, west of Cleveland. He was picked up on the beach by a farmer who's been caring for him ever since. Isn't it kind of funny that you haven't heard from him before? That hurricane was a couple of months ago. Well, he was out of his mind from the shock of what happened to him. Did the Coast Guard say anything about the yacht? No. Johnny, I'm afraid the charm owner is at the bottom of Lake Erie. Well, where is he now? In Cleveland, in a small private hospital. Well, hadn't you better go over there and get him, bring him back here? I told the Coast Guard we would. Mona, you're not really glad that he's been found, that he's still alive, are you? No, I'm not. I guess I never really loved Charles. I'm not sure he really loved me. He was a big shot, always out in the town, doing a lot of entertaining, that sort of thing. I was, well, I was very pretty then. Kind of a business asset for him. When were you and Charles married, Mona? Nine years ago. It looks as though he's done pretty well by you. I never had any reason to complain. About that, I mean. 
But the things he did to make his money, it was... Well, I guess it was legal, but it wasn't right. It was uh, almost like stealing, the way he promoted a lot of worthless inventions, penny stocks, worthless real estate, that sort of thing. But he always did all right. And you. Well, who worries about conscience when things are going well? A lot of people, Mona. But then they made him stop his... Stop the things he was doing. And Charles became very strange. He took up religion like a fanatic. Oh? Kept giving his money away to a lot of crazy charities. Money I could have used. And he got moody. He'd go off alone for weeks at a time, pay no attention to me. That's what I meant when I said I was lonely, Johnny. Not just since the accident that lost the boat and... And Paul. Paul again, huh? Don't you understand? These crazy things have been going on for over a year now. That's why I'm not jumping with joy that Charles is alive. Do you blame me? <sighs> Hadn't we better drive on over to Cleveland and get him? All right. I'll run upstairs and change my clothes. Excuse me. I'll be ready in a minute. Maybe I should have felt a bit more sympathetic, but I didn't. Maybe Charles Keeley did marry her simply because he could afford to keep a smart, pretty ornament around at his beck and call. Yeah, but the chances were she'd married him solely for the things his money could buy her. She took a long time changing her clothes, which didn't surprise me, so I poured myself a drink. I glanced over some of the magazines on the coffee table. I got up and stared out of the window for one of something better to do. Wandered about the room. Wandered into the oak panel den. I looked over the shelves of fine books, the gun collection, and the cabinet in the corner. And almost idly, I reached out toward the leather top desk to shove back a slip of paper that stuck out of one of the drawers until I saw what it was. It was an unpaid bill, several months old, from an exclusive New York shop for some very expensive gowns. And inside, the drawer was packed with unpaid bills, thousands of dollars worth of them, and statements bearing a polite, firm warning to pay up or else. No wonder Keeley's sweet, charming wife had hoped she'd never hear from him again. Gone, he was worth 35000 to her, and the yacht 106000 Perhaps somehow, Mona Keeley had even had a hand in the wrecking of that yacht. I wondered, and I decided I didn't care much for people like this. But my meditations were suddenly interrupted by a sound from the doorway, and there she stood. A pretty little pearl-handled 25 caliber Colt in a dainty gloved hand. I'm ready, Johnny. Are you... So I see. Ready for what, Mona? I guess that depends, doesn't it? Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Our flag now numbers 50 stars, and behind each star there stands yet another flag representing one of the 50 states. Wisconsin's state flag bears the state motto, Forward, and a likeness of the state mascot, the Badger. The word Badger was a nickname for the miners in southwest Wisconsin. During the mining boom just prior to 1830, the people who came from Illinois mined only during the good season and left during the bad. They were called suckers, just like the fish in the streams. But the busy Wisconsinites, with either too little time to leave or to build a house, moved into abandoned mine shafts to live as badgers. The Wisconsin banner pays tribute to these industrious natives. Wisconsin state flag, the flag of the 30th state to enter the Union, was adopted on April 26, 1913. And now, Act Three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Charmona Matter. Mona Keeley stood there in the door of the den, a 25 caliber Colt in her hand. For she'd caught me going through the drawer of a desk, through papers that showed only too clearly why the loss in a storm of a $100,000 yacht might well have been carefully planned. Why she wished that her husband had gone down with it. You shouldn't have done it, Johnny. You shouldn't have looked in that desk. Pretty good proof, isn't it, Mona, that the wreck of the Charmona was no accident. I don't know how your husband worked it and still managed to get back to shore alive. You don't know what you're talking about. But he almost didn't make it, if what you've told me is the truth. Maybe that's because he didn't anticipate that the storms from Hurricane Audrey would hit Lake Erie. Maybe it's because... Well, we'll soon find out. Will you? Yes, when we drive over to the hospital in Cleveland and talk with him, if he's really there. Oh, he's there, all right. 
And you and I are going for a drive, but not to Cleveland. All right. Now. Oh, put that thing down, Mona. Sorry, sweetheart. That little thing in your hand is about as accurate as a slingshot. Now, why don't you... No, don't move. I still don't get it, though. Oh? What? And I'm sure you must have been in with your husband on his deliberate sinking of the yacht. If you think Charles sank it deliberately, Johnny, you're all wrong. Then I certainly don't get it. Because if... Oh, now, wait a minute. You've made a couple of cracks about... What was his name? Paul? Do you want to know the truth? Paul was the pilot for Charles, and there's been no word about him. So he must have gone down with the Charmona. That's why I'm lonely and feel the way I do. Mona, this whole thing smells worse to me he every minute. He was young, and he was kind, and he loved me. I was glad when they found that Charmona had gone down because the money for it would be mine. And I could get free of Charles, and Paul and I could... That's why I hope Charles was gone. Yeah, another $35,000 for you. You're about the crummiest lot I've ever run into. Look at this, Mona, here on the desk. What? This solid gold table lamp. What about and it? And there beside you, that expensive mirror. What are you talking about? Well, look. Why did you do that? To get this gun off oh, you. No, you... Oh, Oh, you... A lot of good this would have done you with the safety on. I'll kill you for this, Johnny. No, I don't think so. And I don't think the police would like it if you try. Oh, no. Do you think they'd blame me for trying to stop you from going through the papers in my desk? For shooting you? No. Wait. I didn't mean that. I couldn't have shot you, Johnny. I... Johnny? Before we go, is there anything you'd like to tell me? Go? Where? Is there anything you'd like to tell me about why Charles really sank the Charmona? No. And I don't think you'll ever know how and why the Charmona went down. Want to bet? No, no, stay right there. Now I've got the gun, remember? Hello? What? Charlie? No. This is a friend of the family. Oh, well, this is Harry Nelson. He gave me a real start. I thought Charlie'd come back from his watery grave. He has, Mr. Nelson. What? Yes, he's in a Cleveland hospital. He's okay. Oh. Well, then I'll talk to him when he gets back. You see, I'm the man who was going to give him 98000 for the Charmona when he got her back from Detroit. Oh. Oh, yes, yeah, sure. But since the Coast Guard tells me she was a complete loss, well, naturally, I think I'll have my deposit back. I'm sure you'll get it, Mr. Nelson. Yeah, okay, Mr. Uh, uh, what did you say your name is? Bye. Who was that? Someone who threw some very interesting light on this whole matter. Come on. Where? Our little drive, remember? To Cleveland. During the five-hour drive to Grace Hospital on the outskirts of Cleveland, I questioned her, using every trick I could. She refused to talk. The theory that Charles Keeley had deliberately sunk his yacht had gone up in smoke. If he had a buyer for it, he wouldn't need to try to collect the insurance on it. But I still knew the whole case was anything but Lily White and hoped that Keeley could explain a few things. When we arrived at the hospital, there was a police lieutenant in Keeley's room and a stenographer. When she saw them, Mona gasped slightly and sank into a chair, to which the lieutenant promptly handcuffed her. As Charles Keeley talked, the whole case became crystal clear. And at the same time, about as sordid as anything I'd ever heard. I should have realized what was up when Paul Matthews suddenly refused to make the trip back to Buffalo with me. He was my pilot, Lieutenant. I phoned the Coast Guard about him as soon as... Yes, sir, it was on the Coast Guard's tip that we ordered Paul Matthews picked up. Picked up? Then he's all right. Shut her up, Lieutenant. Or get her out of here. As I started to say... They not only picked him up, but found where he bought the various parts for the little uh, device he used. Good. Device? What are you talking about, Lieutenant? Let me tell him. Sure, go ahead, Mr. Keeley. The Miss Stenographer will have it all down on the record. I should have known what was up when Paul suddenly decided not to go back with me just before sailing time. You see, I've suspected for some months that he and my wife behind my back... Charles. Shut up, you rotten little... Go on, Mr. Keeley. I... I should have known then, but I had to get the cruiser back to Buffalo to a friend who'd offered me cash for it. Harry Nelson. Yes. Enough to get me back on my feet again. And I didn't know why Paul had left me to make the trip alone until the explosion about five hours out. What? Yes, Mr. Dollar, up forward, where there couldn't possibly have been anything explosive. 
A bomb of some sort? What else, Dollar? It was luck, sheer luck, that I was sailing in close, that I'd put on a life preserver because of the storm. That was the tail end of the hurricane down south, you understand? Yes, and it was luck that she went down right off Palace Rock. Yeah, that's exactly where the Coast Guard divers found her early this morning. A hole as big as a house blown out of her front end. Yes, that storm, that hurricane may have taken a lot of lives, but it saved mine. All I can say is I'm glad there are courts to take care of situations like this. I myself would hate to have to dirty my hands any further. Yeah, it probably does take all kinds to make a world. But believe me, the world would be a lot better off without some of those kinds. The claim on the yacht, sure, it'll have to be paid. And to a man I honestly think is trying to live a decent life for a change. Expense account total, including incidentals, and the trip back to Hartford, 103.80. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Our star will return in just a moment. An old English proverb states that a friend in need is a friend indeed. We've all heard it before, but how many of us have realized the full import of its meaning? When Jose Lara Valverde, an eight-year-old Spanish boy, was in need, he found out what real friendship could be. Stricken by a rare glandular disease, little Jose began to lose his fight for survival when his vital supply of drugs ran out. In a desperate call for help, an amateur radio operator named Conte broadcast a weak signal over the European airwaves. The plea was picked up by a ham operator, Hans Ketterle, in Germany, who relayed the urgent message to a nearby United States Air Force unit. The American airmen quickly dug up the only available drugs of the kind needed. They flew the Mercy package by jet to Madrid. From there, an ambulance screamed its urgent way 190 miles to Andujar, Jose's hometown. The medicine saved his life but only temporarily. Another source had to be found, and it was again in Germany. The two rare drugs were again rushed by American jet fighter pilots, by helicopter, and by Air Force staff car through high winds and thunderstorms to the bedside of the stricken boy. The medicine was given to Jose, and again he responded. This same life and death drama was repeated elsewhere in Spain when men of the United States Air Force came to the rescue of another young Spanish boy in need of another rare drug. People to people giving is more than a program. It is an act of friendship. It is a fight for freedom, the right of all men everywhere. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. This is Dan Coverley speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.